Last minute, huh? Last minute. <laughs> Thank you. 
I do in my is that we see the microtubules quite nicely continuous so this continuous as um, Peter Bass was showing by illustration. And also embedded in this next line, actually it's not very similar structure as for illustration. We often see lots of pointers coming in. And within the axons, you see those are the boundaries, right? And um, those tiny gray dots and the holes, so called clear vesicles, it shows that the kind of vesicles, that components of the classical chemical transmission. And um, both synaptic vesicles and actually half the line a structure, this is so called electron dense structure, and then giving name, um, various people giving them as pre synaptic densities or active zones and so on. But it is the hallmark of this density that marks the right of synapse cycles, the asymmetric junctions and the actions of synapse cycle these um, post class universe. Only through this action and those are the post synapse cells can be triggered as a human transaction cascade and then relay the signal in the unidirectional way as from a prison on itself and to the post -nest. And I always love looking at this in the picture is that it's, it's really a steel picture that is a big reflection of autism, the animal scale and self scale. But this picture actually gives you a tremendous dynamic feelings. That is, a lot of microtubules that are vesicles seem to be captured and you've heard about motor proteins, presumably they're being transported. Okay. And you're also wondering is that then why are those synaptic vesicles kind of stuck here, don't hop onto, um, do they hop onto the microtubules and to be carried away? So this is a typical synaptic cell, presumably close to about 80 to 90 percent of the synaptic and in the central nervous system, the only action is called amyxonal synapses. Rather than, as some of the illustrations shown, that the synapses are only formed at the end of axons, actually, synapses form all of axons. Um, so, and then basically to understand synapses formation, is um, the central goal for over decades, many decades, is about identifying what are individual vesicles, uh, vesicle carbos, and how do they get to where the sites are. And uh, this is just an uh, overview and pretty out of date, but I'm going to mostly you can visually grasp the idea that within the axons, the motors, um, recognizing all different carbos, that they will be constantly transported. Bidirectionally, unidirectionally, and through some of what they call as stochastic events, and they get stuck um, in the region which could be traffic jam in some ways, and that forms a so called primitive um, synaptic vesicle with these sites. That is, they're not the robust um, synapses as what I will show you in a minute, but through those um, primitive sites, they can disassemble and clear the traffic jam and move on. Oh, they can be um, stabilized by contact with post synaptic cell. By that way, and those primitive release sites get um, stabilized and to growth process by recruiting additional synaptic vesicles and components, eventually become mature synapses. When we define the mature synapse, is actually at this point there are involved vesicle release. And now the trigger. Um, mostly to action potential calcium influx and then trigger for synaptic um, synapses of us. But synapses are also very dynamic. Even with mature synapses, they actually undergo plasticity, they can disassemble and they form in the new places. Okay. Um, what the interesting thing about is that if you minute um, biological sample uh, structure wise in space, but it has many amount of proteins. That proteomic approach has been used to study synapses in many ways. And depending on how sensitive the proteomics approaches are, it's been estimated that lists of over thousand proteins that localize to the presynaptic node, you know, and maybe over two thousand proteins that some are affiliated with post synaptic cells, particularly in 
this uh, electron density structure called this density. Okay, so there's a lot of proteins. And a lot of those proteins also organizing vesicular structures in a very different fashion. This is particularly um, shown that in the precept terminal, which the sole function is to lead the vesicle to release in the fast way. But this vesicle clustering can be physiologically and somewhat morphologically categorized into so called reserve tubes. That is, not all the vesicles are ready to release, <coughs> but they're just there to stay um, for additional action. And a small pool has actually undergone some vesicle fusion, it's called a um, recycling pool. And some of the ones within the recycling pools have only a small, small fraction. Contact the membrane are so called readily released with the status of contraction potential that will produce. And um, eventually, this action leads to um, the uh, neurotransmitter releasing the cleft from the capture by this process. How do we know this? This is all purely by volcanical fractionation. That is, you write it up for me, and then you go through a series of those gradients, rotation, um, run uh, some of the iron gradients, and then you separate the fractions that's particularly enriched in the synaptic membrane. Uh, the way they could do it uh, is also through different um, segmentation. So presynaptic fraction is usually segmented in one fraction more so than postsynaptic um, sours just postsynaptic. Generally, you're absolutely right that it is not actually clear, but perhaps it gets up to about 90% in the predominant and presynaptic and postsynaptic. And all those about chemical purification procedures would be about the in the 70s about um, centrifugation. Okay. And um, okay, so the point here is that those proteins are organized in a way for the purpose of um, this synaptic vesicle clustering. They are not only just proteins, but they all have more or less features, so called scaffolding proteins in some ways. They interact extensively among themselves. One of the examples we'll see this also later is to show that the hallmark of the prisoner terminal is the physical <coughs> density. And the purpose of this density is so that the vesicles can be close to uh, the density. And the density is essentially a concentrated uh, voltage gated calcium channels. In order for that to happen, and here is a large reveal of a molecule that suppresses Vesicles have vesicle membrane proteins that's attached to them. They will interact with those active cell proteins, as I'll illustrate here. You probably don't really see that clearly. But each of the active cell proteins have all sorts of natural domains, and all those arrows are saying that every one of them will be interacting with this five proteins. Okay? Um, the complexity of all of this and leading to um, a central question that for decades people have been trying to address is a lot of proteins. And, but what actually are the key molecules and the in function in which we do a cell process to trigger this over the assembly and to actually localize those matters on the right side, not just run them everywhere, and what are the molecules that regulating the synaptic function of the release and um, in what way to react into calcium release. Okay. So the, um, if you are a um, physiologist, what would you do to address this kind of questions? Anyone who's a physiologist? Physiologists generally <laughs> do this and they go through the minimum potential and they try to do they want you to know which ion channels, which curves will be contributing to the <coughs> They tend to go for the receptors, channels, on the membranes, and then characterizing the channel profiles, they can guess whether it's sodium channels or plasma channels. But if you are, say, um, 
stage was used to deduce the meaning of the problem. But he wanted to work on a matters of with the nervous system, and he decided that I just want to pay for his own company to study the problem in the world. Okay? And for that, he decided to focus on naturals. He decided probably like 130 senators eventually would have to see that next. Because the nature of that. Um, it's a small, it's another reason is that it's the only nematode um, that actually can be fixed by the end and preserve the structure preserved the best. Which is actually never spoken in anywhere in the history of that particular research. So what he did is then when he said that he himself is a geneticist, he decided to get him all mutations. But the fact that the TMS could be uh, fixed by the electron microscope and then be recruited a couple of uh, actually times technician of the light. He recruited John White to reconstruct the entire world. And that's what is the only organism that's able to reconstruct using about 8,000 processing um, sessions of um, microbiome, where John White reconstructed the whole. Neuro uh, cell boundaries and synaptic uh, connections. Okay. So that took almost 10 years, but now it's been uh, looking at the brain uh, that there's a big force basically at the EM level reconstructing the uh, tiny uh, uh, tubing of uh, what the brain is either in the optic cortex or in the olfaction. Okay, so Skelet has um, somatic cells, it's a fixed number, it's not the only organism actually that has a fixed number of cells. The reason is the reason why. And it's 959 somatic cells, and it's written in two of them are classified neurons. John Lennon, the end of the construction, allowed him to classify the based on morphology into over 118 types, and um, there are now estimated about 106,000. Okay, so that was um, all the ground, but they really used the, 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 the never ever go back to tell us that the never has said this, but a few of them know about this, is that John Sidney used the genetics he thought of that to look for genetics of the development of the nervous system, and the best is to look for mutants that's giving behavior that's Makes sense, right? Brain controls behavior. Uh, you should get um, any mutants or any um, parallel animal that will get into the genes and eventually into the system. Um, so he collected a lot of those mutants and named those mutants as Unk or Unkmorgany. Unfortunately, the very strong Unk that he isolated all turned out to be mutants affecting muscle development. Because those animals don't move, their nervous system is actually developed. The real study of the nervous system in terms of its biology probably aided and um, well started with uh, Marty Chalfi, who dissected the specifics of lineage that was related to the touch neurons, but we will talk about it and go into details. And the fact that Marty Chalfi later on developed GFP as a non invasive um, marker for visualizing the nervous system. Now that Took down like uh, 10 years to reconstruct the nervous system. You wait use the neurons and motors to express GFP. It will take you about a week to see the microscope to know what this is called and where they go. Okay? So, um, the key point for uh, going to Sierra that's a way to look at this analysis is that there is optic structure conservation. Despite the Sierra and um, and even uh, so far apart, the ultrastructure conservation has been seen. That is, um, there's a brain, this is what uh, the synapses in general have been taught in the textbook. Grace has a terminal and vesicles tied into the brain active zone, opposed to the postsynaptic um, density, that's the postsynaptic cell, and the mitochondria. But if you look in the Seattle's, it is actually a neuron muscle junction, and that's a crease that terminal, and the mitochondria. <coughs> So this level of structure is in trouble. And the argument is that perhaps the 
assembly process will likely to be okay. So with this idea uh, going in, we decided to um, take the approach, combine our trophies on GFP visualization, and also the time that um, Sandy's post up with um, Mike Nolan identified the synaptic proteins as um, so this says pick up synaptic proteins and visualize them. So uh, we then fuse the synaptic protein and protein and two GFP and express them. The key here is express them in synaptic cells. If you express um, this number in every neuron, as a previous slide, you're not going to be able to tell that which synaptic terminal on which part will be involved in the current court. But here, they speak expressing selectively in a subset of neurons called GABA neurons, and they talk about touch neurons, that those neurons, the someone located in the central nerve cord, spinal cord, they were sending um, axons to reach the important muscle, is that this ends will form this impossible synopsis visualized as a single chromosome. Okay, single flexible chromosome are related to the single pre-snap terminal identifier. Okay, so now we could see and contract them with your cell biologist to assist them in taking movies. And as geneticists, what you do, you feed that uh, transgenic animal with mutagenic potentially nasty chemicals. Um, and the mother is spawn, and the mother will lay uh, proteins that carry the mutation only three days. And the other thing to remember is self-fertilize. So therefore we don't do any process. So that um, a week later we have the brood of worm in there, the polar panama will have the mutations on the labels and then you can go for what kind of things. Okay. So if I was the new runner, I probably would do the first thing, pick up a bunch of own animals and go for what is most as <coughs> you guys are doing the early detective lethal mutation Can I maintain the lethal mutations? Yes, you can maintain lethal mutations because the siblings are on the label. So you just keep passing the heterozygous, you can look for lethal mutants, you can look for sterile animals. But if they're in wrong with these, don't even throw them at us. Okay? But this seems to be uh, a simple. The hard work is where you do screen. So you do have to train yourself and uh, well recognize the Okay. Okay, so sounds good. Um, so you do have to train yourself and to recognize the size of the chromosome and the spacing so you can recognize well as well. Now you close your eyes. Okay. You can you guys close your eyes. Now, open your back and then say, are those mutants or not compared to us? Quite obvious, right? But remember, this is even shorter to you. But what I did as a screen is that this mutation only comes in one of those thousand dimensions. Essentially, on the previous slides, we do have to screen through a thousand forms in front of us and to tell this one from the population manner. We just decided not to do behavior for reasons we need that behavior strengths in the brain is saturated with everything and every gave a nervous system defense to all muscles. Okay, so this visual strength then led us um, to identify <coughs> reasons that purely disrupting the synaptic morphology. Okay. Now, will anybody object to this approach at this point? At least with which concerns. It's completely GFP based. Right, it's completely GFP based. And we could completely use it as an artifact. It's, a, it's just a GFP for the internet to do the synaptic architecture. Okay. Um, we're a little bit as well. Sure, and that's exactly the point most people say that cannot be. You know, we have to prove to us that. Those molecules indeed affect in that architecture by localizing those proteins <coughs> or the genes and code proteins to where they localize. If they turn out to be, say, uh, cytoplasmic proteins, 
the ability to use the as well. So that could be entirely back to the protein's ability, not related to synapses. So, anyway, um, we ended up cloning each of the mutants and then found um, each one of them being called conserved protein. And then we went ahead to use a combination of factors that essentially were by um, immune cell chemistry or uh, gene tagging. Indeed, we found every gene, every of the gene corresponding to our mutant and localized to the percent term. Okay, and um, we also did additional experiments essentially to show that um, the uh, the ultra structure is synapsis is altered. Okay, so one of the examples shown here, insert PSC2, as the other one is the two, because a conserved protein called mammalian protein called liver and alpha, that's one protein to live in the animal. And this protein actually been identified as um, a natural protein for the transgender um, receptor in the lab. Um, it's a receptor protein that has some phosphatase and phosphatase identified by two hybrids, which will show that it binds to the major cell of the mesh. And um, this is just a GP uh, reporter and it shows that um, the is getting diffused. Then we went ahead to do a EM micro section, uh, in section and then reconstruct, and so that we can quantitate the number of vesicles and the length of the epitomes to show that indeed that also take two actually alters the Size and then the last question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you have given the first and I think that's correct, right? The GMP. Right. So, how do I distinguish between the right one and the right one? How do I distinguish? How do I distinguish? At this point, I can't distinguish. This point I'm relying on the fact is that. Okay, so at this point, we rely on is that whatever we can detect by the eye is a dense population of vesicles. If there are single kind of vesicle transport, and my eyes can not going to pick it up, and I don't care, because only the small, stable, stably assembled synthesis can have this level of fluorescent intensity. What do you don't care? What's that? What do you don't care? No, no. I said for this screen, I don't care. And then afterwards, we did get transport mutants. But those transport mutants will have a different phenotype. That's because the vesicle, the transport ones, got jammed. And then we start seeing them showing up in that top of positions. It's exactly what sends them. It appeared to be. But then when you start doing the EM, you actually can recognize using additional combinating factors. What they find the true synapses, it has to be pre and post aligned. And what they find the transport defects is usually you don't find the post synapse itself. Is there a morphology in terms of axons? No, we don't see uh, much of a difference in um, axon morphology. So all we have to be that is the axon overloads, all posts and trajectory is going on. So this is purely a synaptic defense. Yes. Based on this model that we have found. 
We found a new term that we were able to transcribe by the very few that come that those actual neural mutants are one of the four trees because we never got out. <coughs> okay, so you're with me up to this one. Okay, so this is just the process that as we start doing it, we never actually saw the um, the artifact that we'll just keep pursuing. In the end, uh, synapses of function test, even though not logically gets disrupted, you see one way to know is the synaptic transmission model. So we have to do causality, and this is where I get taught to be causalogists, or people get taught to be causalogists to be uh, electric causalogists, so there is defects in synaptic transmission. Okay. And the good thing about it is the gene is conserved, <coughs> and later on, some of the people show the same thing. And um, just to convince you, indeed, we have to the data to show this is localized and active zone, and that is um, in the label of the synaptic vesicle. Okay, in the label of the two, you can see this identity is embedded in the class of the vesicles, it's not entirely overlapping. With the vesicles because the density is only a small fraction of the synapse. And in the union, usually it's not always portable, but you're able to see a couple dots of the two right at the density of that vesicles. Yes? What I don't think that is important. So, what condition, so right by the way, right, which is pretty much the what condition lies the site? Where the for very different type of What marks that this is the thing that is going to do? Um, okay, so in this frame, we did not look for the synapse specific genes. And that's the reason is that in this type of phenomenon, the entire exome is capable of forming synapses. It's still a mystery, this is still a mystery related to the transport, is that in Pascal synapses, there is a minimum distance to separate the synapse. What is that? Minimum distance gets controlled, and I like to ask the transport of my computer people. Um, could that be intrinsic factors due to cytoskeleton that needed to separate the spacing? Or related to how fast, how much of the Persistivity of motor carrier cargo to go up. And um, so, this is the neuron that some people go extensively to talk about. It, is that a neuron that's different from the first set of neuron is that it's not like um, every, along the axon that every part can form synapses. It's actually only form synapses on the specific branch of the synaptic branch. And it's on the synaptic branch, there's only a uh, certain region can form. Synapses to give you a quite good knowledge to study specifically. And our implementation was also identified in uh, Sunday's old lab and uh, basically the synapses of the synaptic patch. Okay. So essentially, when we're using genetic strings and we get identified mutations, and some other people using a different uh, synaptic model may also identify, but possibly similar phenotype or slightly different phenotype. But the point here is that um, my club and I uh, formed the gene and I realized it tells absolutely nothing because um, it's a large protein, it's conserved, um, the bacteria genes and the mouse genes not going to be studied. And there's a crossover gene that was studied um, about the same time to go back in this junction. So with that idea, we thought, well, this has to be a very important model uh, to conserve and we learn about that the synapses, why I have the synapses, and we for our country to say how we figure out this protein function. The only suggested uh, idea is to us is the presence of brain fever demand and match to the early days of the universe and the protein so I'm just going to um, 
skip central data located in similar time culture that require the optimal localized and the basic idea said that in the optimal localized synapses, without it, you will get in the normal synapses like that. Okay? Alright, so now here is the same question for you. Now, it's a novel protein, and if the synapses are back and lose it, you know, disrupt the synapse morphology, that was important. So, you wanted to know how does it work. And if you are that kind of support, you do. You do what you want. You do not give your size. Okay, but that's. Mass fat, right, so we can find proteins as well from the fast here. Yeah? Okay. And anything else? It's so hard. Again, the idea is to get finding problems. And what could be the drawback of that? <coughs> they may not be functioning well. Right. Okay, so then we wanted to, again, use the genetic approach to see what would be the functioning relevance. Now, this dictated what we're talking The reason is that when we did this program, as we did in microscopy, there's no behavior. Okay, so we can't really, unless we redo this program using microscope and then to look for genes from a phenotype not be intense. So we're a little smarter. Okay, so we start making genetic double mutants. Alright, so the idea here here's the wild type with some very nice genetic morphology. RPM1 and we do quite a lot of synapses, but those are the ones that actually perform just fine. They're not critical in any way. And the other thing I told you about is C2 also affecting synapses, and it also moves as well. Not much different. Okay? And um, when we make selected the double mutants, and here we go, we got an animal that's completely parallel. Okay. And um, when we made this, this two as one of the double mutants, we got the parallel that actually really justified the whole purpose of our scheme. We got the here the whole one, is this says is the functional way the two of them are important to contribute to um, the animal movement. And it can correlate this parallel um, phenotype to complete loss of the synapses close by morphology and so what's good about having the synthetic phenotype is the following now. We can feed the animals with mutagens, with double mutants, and then look for genetic suppressors. So that will either suppress this mutant, then you will get back the wild type. All mutations suppress this mutant, you will also get back the wild type. Okay? So it's very easy to is a paralyzed animal on the place they don't move. And um, very few of them start moving, you collect them, you collect the last album of them, and you worry about it because you please them. And you sort them out one by one. Okay. So, <clears throat> I'm just going to skip this one. Come back to um, So we found those mutants, and then the top job is to actually figure out the specific suppressors for the synapses. Then we we'll go back, is from those behavior express animals, go back looking at the synapses. And you probably ask, why do you want to look for suppressors? Because the real reason is that this is RPM1 is linked to two protein of the connection. And that means that without this gene, whatever the other protein should be differentiated will not be. So the phenotype of the RPM1 is due to persistent signal of the substrate. So there are mature thinking, knocking out the substrate from the substrate signal rates that should restore the signal on the space is back to normal. So that's the suppressor genetic screening. You can we right, you can get interdependent suppressors as absolutely possible. It depends on the legal use. So this is really critical. Now when you do suppressor string and um, you first need to know, are you using 
using a non mutation. Right? We use a non mutation where we can work it back to a function that's pretty cool. If you use a distance mutation, and then you can have a lot of teeth, and then they intend to spend the time to about that when she's talking about transfer. That definitely gives us an interesting opportunity. Okay? So this is the idea is that this is what I look for. Suppressors as a way to gain up the substrates and the substrate the signal transaction house. Alright. And we have all of them, and that is the magical mode, and um, that could still be giving us many more suppressors on the five years work. And you will find that this presentation takes three kinds of steps in order to be a kinase cascade. So kinases are um, triple kinase and the double kinase goes to kinase. And if you interact with them, each one of them individually, you will suppress on the optimal genotype. Is there any way to initiate the suppression? Everyone has to be double in one area. So, you would like to know which of them is the suppression? Yeah, so you want to know which gene. Um, uh, to be honest, this is why uh, it was a good concept from here to here. We got tons of suppressors, and I put this as a very small uh, letter, just this map and cloning these fibers from the mutation to find the gene. To establish a password. It's not correct. Okay. Indoors, we have a lot of people arguing about almost nothing that is Okay, so uh, Sandy alludes to uh, this is genetic and constant debate, and why, in certain cases, the suppressor system works, in certain cases, the suppressor system fails. And this fundamental way that the suppressor strain in this case is looking for things in the absence of the gene and um, is negative regulation. Okay, so the gene negatively regulates something else, then suppressor strain will work. Okay? And if you're looking for signal transacting pathways as a positive regulation, you'll be looking for things that's similar and suppressor strain will not. And if you're looking for proteins, protein interactions, depending on the phenotype, the suppressor strength can give you compensatory changes, therefore, you find more problems. And the problems why you do not get, you get very clear suppressors. Literally, the reason they have assembled is a is positive process, whereas the unbeautiful process is a negative. All right, so um, we've got the um, getting to make it. And then some people have luck, and it's that not because it's early days when we try to map and clone to five years to get three genes. On the other hand, nowadays, I can have um, 10 mutations, whole genome sequence within um, three months, at least I would guess to where they are. All right, so I won't bore you about here. But the key point then, we really have to look for which is our substrate. Now, you have user libraries who look at the substrate and wanting to do the first thing is that they have to be in the same domain, that is, they have to be in the same axis. So, to do this, we label each of the genes of the clone and we see which one is the synapsis. Sure enough, the upstream map kinase is in the back of the synapsis, synapsis, and sure enough, in the absence of user libraries, and uh, its signal is increased. And both by the new um, semi and by um, Western blot. And then it become a volcanoes at this point. We need to show that indeed the history bias can bind to it's a substrate, and then the history bias can help can um, catalyze or stimulate the extinction. So with that, yes, go ahead. In why that you do this so in this case, in the wild type, what is the phenotype of the suppressor? And it's actually superficial wild type on its own, which is why we can isolate it in the mutant, in the history of this mutant, because 
melting up down the substrate is the animal are healthy, so therefore it can become suppressed animals for the suppressing. However, my second topic comes back to tell you that those genes once um, depleted have a new role in the injury stress pathway. Okay. That is in development, those genes need to be kept down through the awakening of the process. And you completely lose it and the organism develops a true body. Anyway, so this is basically um, how you just give them an idea that we look for suppressors, rationalize it, it's like losing these two bodies will make this kind of cascade stay high, and that's why in knocking down the kinase, these two bodies, suppressor springs, will lead to the identified cascade. So that's all I actually wanted to invent. Say for the first part, um, and um, just thank the people who um, no longer with me. Mostly, this work is done by the former uh, postdoc and former graduate students and other former postdoc. Okay, and uh, we'll take a break. We'll ask for more questions. Yes. What kind of suppressors are you using in the This is a, oh yes, yeah, so what kind of suppressors are you using in the non mutations? And then there's always a wide group of suppressors in this case. So that's what we say, because the mystery lattice is negatively regulating um, the kind of stress phase. So anything not done, they will get in the gene. Okay. And yeah, so now the other cases, we actually did find one suppression mutation of a gene that will be cost of one, but not, not related, which cannot be a human function mutation in um, the liver. And in that case, which is why we're going to move to this, that it's very hard to find a different pathway that suppresses the screen because of its cost of um, regulation. In case of injury to the cells, we say that for a second. Okay. And then. So, when you uh, watch the nutrition, that's how you are talking the nutrition. If I block the recognition, and that will cause the kinase to be very high. So we can do the reverse experiment in this case that if we just activate the kinase artificially, that will mimic the loss of the structure. Yes, there are synapses. Okay, so why is it that the phenotype, um, as if there's no synapses, right? So why is the kinase activity high and leading to absence of synapses? And that's because I don't think I have been able to answer that question. And this has something to do with synapses needs to be assembled in the optimal level. And all I can say is the outcome of this recreated interaction keeps the kinase downstream of components, which in a second lecture will basically be some um, power of genes. Their activity has to be maintained the optimal in order to have the proper assembly. Okay. Any more 